Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our Spatial Data Science Symposium. And uh, welcome from our university at the Buffalo Local Hub here. Um, today, we have uh, um, a session and with a series of uh, exciting presentations uh, on spatial data science for disaster resilience. Um, my name is Inji. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geography. And uh, here is uh, my colleague, Dr. Andrew Crooks. Uh, we are together and also with our speakers, we are organizing our session here. Um, so today we will first have a keynote presentation from Dr. Lei Zhou from Texas A&M University. Uh, and uh, he, uh, his presentation will be about uh, achieving a smart and resilient future with spatial data science. And uh, after that, we will have some brief, uh, brief question and answers after that. So uh, Lei, this stage is yours. Thank you so much, Inji, for the uh, wonderful introduction. I also would like to uh, express my appreciation to the organization uh, committee of the Spatial Data Science Symposium. I also appreciate the invitation from Dr. Inji Hu and Dr. Andrew Crooks for offering me the chance to share our recent research. And today I want to share about how spatial data science can be used to achieve a smart and resilient future. To start with, I want to share three different pictures in here. They were supposed to be videos, but I really apologize because of the technical issue. I can only show the PDF version of my slides. So the first one is a flash flood event in Beichuan in Sichuan, China in 2022. Because of the event, thousands of families have to be uh, relocated within eight hours. And uh, based on the image, you can basically see the devastating impact of this flash flood event and destroyed the roads and also the houses and properties within the small village. The second event is a winter storm Yuri, which took place in the state of Texas two years ago. It was the costliest natural disaster ever hit the state of Texas. Well, ironically, after two years, this year, Texas experienced a lot of the extreme heat in winds, and uh, quite a few people lost their lives um, during extreme heat recently. And the third one is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has affected the worldwide um, population. So uh, it was actually a video about my father, who was the oldest volunteer from Wuhan University, trying to help manage the community during the first outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, he was trying to deliver medications to the patients who were not able to visit the hospital because of the citywide lockdown. And during the natural disaster and uh, or hazardous events, um, we can clearly see is that different communities actually uh, show very diverse response behaviors and also diverse impacts. Let's take the middle one, the winter storm Yuri, as one example. These two nighttime light images were obtained in the city of Houston before and after the winter storm. There are three communities highlighted uh, in the white boxes. So as we can see before the winter storm, those three communities have very high nighttime light image signal values, indicating they have a very good uh, electricity system uh, supporting the community. But after the winter storm, even though the nearby communities has mostly recovered from the winter storm and the power outage, those three communities still show very low nighttime light image signal values. So that, that indicates even under the same threat of the uh, climate hazard or other nature or um, other type of disasters. Different communities, because of their diverse socioeconomic characteristics, the built environment, as well as the natural environment conditions, they will show different levels of recovery and impacts. And that is something we usually define as the concept of um, disaster resilience. So when we're referring to disaster resilience, uh, nowadays we usually want to define resilience as a very specific concept meaning the resilience of what to what. We can consider the community functions, could be transportation function, could be the mental health or the social network functions as the y-axis in here. And then x-axis will indicate the disaster management cycle, meaning the four phases from preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. And during a disaster, each community will experience something like this. It will experience some function loss at the beginning mostly in the preparedness and response phase, and then recover to a new equilibrium. And the purpose of enabling disaster resilience is try to reduce the function loss 
accelerate recovery and also enable communities to adapt and more successfully rebuild to a higher equilibrium. So as we can tell, disaster resilience is very important for us to understand how disaster impact human communities and how we can bounce back from the negative impacts. And the previous study have tried to develop different type of indexes or uh, metrics to evaluate disaster resilience. So for example, FEMA has the uh, national risk index with community resilience as one index in the set of indexes being shared and used, which can help us identify areas at risk guide the urban planning and inform disaster preparedness. And even during the pandemic, the resilience indexes have been very helpful in identifying locations to allocate the COVID-19 test sites and also allocate the vaccinations to the most vulnerable populations. However, different research have developed different types of disaster resilience indexes. And also for disaster resilience indexes, they are very helpful for us to mitigate and prepare for upcoming disasters. But as we all know, every disaster is uncertain and very different. So in each disaster, there are quite a few of emergencies and unexpected events happening. For example, during the recent uh, wildfire in Hawaii. So we need to have the near real-time or real-time monitoring or observations about the impacts from disasters and offer um, actionable uh, immediate responses. And that's the reason we started to introduce the near real-time geospatial big data into the game. So together with the traditional GIS data, we can now leverage the data collected from remote sensing, human mobility, social media, or different types of the weather or climate sensors to better observe the human dynamics, the urban development, as well as the changes within our environment. And those information, which can be mined into knowledge or actionable plans through the spatial data science to support disaster management cycle that can be used by stakeholders. So that stakeholders can target the most vulnerable communities or people in need of help with, uh, in a timely ma manner. So uh, a lot of researchers have already um, spent uh, considerable efforts to advance the use of social, uh, spatial data science for disaster resilience research. And again, I apologize for the, this is, there's no animation in here. So some of the studies were not showed and uh, displayed uh, entirely. So I actually list five examples from the use of remote sensing with self-supervised learning for flood mapping by Dr. Chen Yinhuang and her research group as well as the use of nighttime light image and statistical analysis to map the power outreach during the winter storm by Dr. Yi Chang and his research group. And also uh, Dr. Crooks uh, has already started investigating the use of social media for earthquake detection back in 2013. And later on, uh, Dr. Man Zhu Yu and her team has developed a CNN model to classify social media data into different categories to enhance and monitor the situation awareness during hazard events. And finally, Dr. Jie Hu and his research group leverage social media data with the natural language processing models to develop advanced top name recognition models to convert textual addresses into coordinates that can support the emergency rescue operations during disasters. And today I want to share uh, some of the efforts that we have made kind of like as a teaser uh, to introduce the upcoming five excellent presentations with more detailed information. And the case study I want to share is about the use of social media for smart disaster resilience. So as we all know, social media has become a one important component of our modern society. Um, nowadays, over 90% of the US uh, residents are using at least one social media platform. And the reason why social media is so popular is because it can be accessible through any place and uh, through any online devices. And that generated a lot of data set. And most of the data can be in the location information of most of the data can be inferred through different methods. And also a lot of social media platforms provide the real time APIs so that we're able to monitor the real time behaviors of human uh, social media activities that can be used as a mirror reflecting what's happening in the real world during disasters. 
and different users have used social media quite differently during disaster events. For example, government used social media as a way to broadcast the recent updates of the disaster events and increase the public awareness about the upcoming hazardous events. Some citizens use social media as a way to communicate and share the recent updates as well as local conditions and local impacts caused by disasters. There are also people using social media as a transportation, uh, as a, a communication uh, avenue to request help and uh, hopefully receive a response from the first responders. So um, we actually were very interested about why people start to use social media more often compared to traditional emergency management um, um, platforms. So we conducted a survey analysis a few years ago, and it turns out people find the use of social media in disaster response is very easy. And it turns out most of the people who request rescue on social media were rescued by the relatives, friends, or volunteers rather than the government organizations. And most of them find the use of social media for emergency management very useful. And we're not the only one who is interested in the use of social media and other cross source platforms for emergency management and disaster response. So this is one platform called Cross Source Rescue, which was established in 2017 during the Hurricane Harvey. And since then, they have already been operated uh, implemented in 28 hazardous events and uh, helped over 94,000 survivors in disaster events. So that is uh, a trend showing that um, the non-government organizations and altruist communities can offer huge help in future disaster events. And the trend is kind of like increasing over the past few years. So think about how social media can be used for disaster response. I want to show this analysis workflow in here because there are quite a few challenges within the workflow. And also we try to solve those challenges through the recent advances within spatial data science. So first, we usually need to collect data from different platforms. And the second step is to geolocation, to convert the data into geographic information that can support spatial analysis. And after the analysis, we also need to interpret the results correctly so that we do not overlook the marginal communities or uh, de derive false information from the data analysis results. But there are also a lot of challenges in all four steps in here. In data collection, we always notice that there are quite a lot of noise information within social media. The information relevant to actionable plans, for example, people needing rescue, or the malfunction of the infrastructures only consists a small portion of the social media data set. Secondly, the way people express the locations will be very different and also very uncertain. We need to find a way to identify people needing rescue or identify the location of users through different attributes. Third, the analysis could be a skill issue in here because most of the social media data provided as the point data but in analysis phase, we usually aggregate data into community level. So we need to select the appropriate scale for our um, data analysis. And finally, we need to avoid any kind of bias in the data interpretation. So let's move on to the four research questions we, we want to address. The first one is how to remove the noisy information within the social media data. After scrutinizing the social media data, we realize there are four types of actionable messages that can be very useful in emergency response. First one is people requesting rescue. Second one is people reporting lost animals. Third one is people complaining or um, updating about the infrastructure malfunctions. And last one is there are also people and organizations trying to offer help and also share the location of the shelters and the emergencies. So to identify the information, those small amount, but also critical information on social media, we need to develop language models that very similar like how people um, view those messages and make decisions. First, we need to understand the content information. And secondly, we will classify the information into one of the four categories or another one named others. So this is where the recent advanced language models and deep learning models can help us accomplish the task. So we have a one uh, architecture called victim finder being modeled in here, which concatenate a BERT model uh, which was one of the best uh, natural language processing model with the uh, CNN model to accomplish the classification tasks in here. And we also test different uh, variants of the BERT model with different types of the classifiers. 
and find out that BERT with the CNN model achieved the best performance compared to other models and also other baseline models in here. With a 91.9 uh, overall uh, accuracy. And based on the information, we're able to uh, calculate and uh, visualize the temporal information showing when when people started to talk about different events and also when people start to request rescue or share those shelter information online. But as geographer, we also care about the spatial patterns. So the next question is how can we derive the geolocation information from the social media data set? And for those of you who are familiar with social media data, you probably notice there are different ways people can express the locations. People can attach a geotag. They can express the location in the user profile or mention the addresses in the text content. And based on recent investigation, we found out the three types of locations are very different and inconsistent. So we need to determine which one we should use based on the different scenarios. And by scrutinizing the Twitter data again, we notice that most of the actionable messages that can help emergency management express the location information within the Twitter content rather than using geotags or in the user profiles. So in other words, we need to develop a way to identify the topo name from those text messages accurately and efficiently. To realize that, we have been collaborating with Dr. Injie Hu, Dr. Yi Chang, and also Dr. Dan Goldberg, leading by my PhD student, Dr. B, uh, student Bin Zhou, to develop a model we called TopaBird, which have achieved the uh, state-of-the-art performance in the precision record and F1 score in uh, seven testing datasets for the top name recognition test. And I'm sorry, again, this was supposed to be a video showing how this framework work to visualize the location of people requesting rescue in near real time during the Hurricane Harvey as an example in here. But I have another map showing the, um, the model being applied in Hurricane Irma also happening in 2017 to show where people request rescue, reporting lost animals, or complain about infrastructure malfunction, or sharing the shelter information in here. And by aggregating data into the administrative boundaries and corresponding the information with the insurance claims, we're able to develop models to predict or uh, to forecast the potential damages caused by disasters. So we have a few baseline models which only consider the social factors or social and geographical factors, as well as the social, geographical, and the, the general disaster to factors. And it turns out the model we use in considering social factor, geographic factor, and fine grilled tweets, meaning the tweets specifically about the infrastructure malfunctions, yield the best performance with an R square of over 80%. Now, moving on to the third step in here is analysis scale. So, if you notice in the previous study, we try to aggregate it into the county level. But is county level the best way to analyze the social media data? or is it sufficient for the real-time operation of emergency rescue? That is a question we need to ask ourselves. So there's one study conducted by um, um, Ke Jing Wang from Louisiana State University, trying to see if the correlation which is demonstrated is significant between the social media activities and disaster resilience in, at the county level still hold at a finer spatial resolution. And the finding here is that it is still hold, but they are much weaker at the zip code area level. So that means we need to consider what is the best skill when we choose spatial analysis. And we also need to consider not only the data availability, but also the operational scale of how disaster affect human communities. Similarly, we also need to consider the modifiable temporal unit problem. So these are two case studies when we try to aggregate the data by hour as well as by day to show the public awareness and sentiment uh, during the hazardous events. And we clearly see there are quite a few extreme values which were overlooked if we aggregate that data at a daily level rather than a finer temporal resolution. Sorry to interrupt, like five more minutes. Okay, sure. And finally, I want to talk about how to remove some of the biases and how we try to uh, accomplish the, uh, removing the biases within social media data. So first, bias is a geographical bias. So consider if there is one person requesting rescue from one building in here, 
with no people request rescue in the surrounding buildings. It doesn't mean there are no people needing rescue in the surrounding buildings or the surrounding buildings were not affected. It could mean there is only one user in here who know how to use social media to request rescue or report the local damages. So we need to incorporate the biased social media data with unbiased remote sensing data and traditional GIS data to yield a better and a more uh, inclusive estimation in here. So I have one very simple framework in here, trying to incorporate Twitter data with the building footprint data, as well as the DM data to evaluate the disaster damage at fine spatial temporal resolution. And it turns out the model performance highly agrees with the official damage report and also reveal some overlooked communities, meaning communities reporting no damage from official report, but being identified having people request rescue or report local damages on social media data. Another bias is a demographic bias. So people always concerned about the representation of the social media users, meaning most of the users are toward younger generation or well-educated generation. So in other words, if we conduct some, for example, sentiment analysis or a situation awareness analysis without considering the demographic bias, we may uh, lead to some uh, overlooking certain communities and that are also voicing themselves but were not included in analysis on social media. So we have another study trying to evaluate the COVID-19 related sentiment by demographics in the US and also um, propose uh, a index we call uh, sentiment adjusted by demographics in short is set index to quantify the public sentiment toward different events. So, um, so to move forward, I want to mention two more challenges and that we also need to um, resolve in, in the future to better leverage geospatial data science in disaster response and the disaster resilience. The first one is about a practical deployment. In an ideal world, people will know how to use different platforms to request rescue Researchers will develop algorithms to identify the information and also platforms to visualize the information. The first responders will access the database and offer help. But it involves the collaboration, complicated collaboration among citizens, data providers, researchers, and first responders. And sometimes they may have inconsistent opinions about whether data should be shared on social media or online platforms. So we have a recent publication summarizing 20 recommendations for different stakeholders to better uh, leverage the social media to, uh, to combat disaster uh, events. Another challenge is about the cascading or compounding disasters. So in, in addition to the short-term health, uh, health and safety impacts from disasters, nature hazards or climate hazards will also lead to industrial fires and cause environmental health issues, which may cause long-term health impacts on human communities. So this is the cascading effects we also need to consider in disaster resilience research. So I just want to share um, the recent projects where it just started this year. One is to build a national infrastructure for human dynamics by um, providing a user-friendly visualization and analytic tools um, that can help everyone to use social media and mobility and other types of data for resilience research. The other one is another project we call Climate Lead, which is trying to use geospatial data science to simulate um, how climate change will affect local environmental health disparities in those overburdened Texas communities along the Gulf Coast in the next 50 years. So people say with the climate change, we're facing more climate hazards in the future and also more intensified climate hazards in the future. So human beings need to be prepared for that. And I would think as geographers, we're also in the best age because we have more diverse and, uh, um, and high resolution geospatial data, as well as advances in spatial data science to help us better observe human behaviors and human disaster interactions. That will help us to bring this, and that will help us to better plan for a more resilient future if we all take the responsibility of building resilient future as part of our, uh, uh, our uh, motivations to conduct spatial research. So that's all my presentation. I really appreciated the support from all my students and also as the funding agencies. And any kind of like questions, comments, or recommendations, extremely welcome and appreciated. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Leigh, for the wonderful presentation. You can clearly hear that we also have applause from our local hub. So, um, Thank you this so is much. a really fantastic yeah. talk and uh, very good timing, too. Uh, so, we have a number of questions already uh, in our uh, QA. So, uh, the first two questions one is from uh, Anita, and the other is from Yano, uh, are related. And I think for everybody, it's very uh, interesting in this question that is, uh, after uh, they post the Twitter or X or with this fast changing uh, of uh, uh, social media uh, uh, culture we are seeing here. So how could our uh, research continue to address this uh, ongoing data accessibility challenges? Thank you so much. And this is a really important question because uh, I guess every social media researchers are now facing the challenge of accessing data. And fortunately, we have the developer's account, which can still run and collect data at this moment. But I do realize um, the fragmentation of the social media data, as well as the APIs being offered by the social media company. So one thing we're trying to do is that we try to learn from the past. In other words, the way we analyze the past uh, social media data is trying to help us ident identify, understand what kind of like socioeconomic, as well as the built environment conditions make people more vulnerable during disasters. And those socioeconomic and built environment data will be available in the future without the impacts of the changes in social media data, API, as well as the policies. So um, in other words, we try to use social media as a, kind of like a ground reference data that can help us build more reliable models based on the traditional GIS data that will be more available and sustainable in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question is, uh, do you see any chance to leverage information from image and also video centric platforms such as Instagram and TikTok? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And I do see the opportunities brought by image or video centric platforms like Instagram or TikTok. I do understand different social media platforms were designed for different purposes. Like Facebook is designed for social networking, um, for friends or people share similar interests. Um, Twitter originally was designed for people to talk about what's going on, what's happening, so people can voice their opinions to the public. Instagram, TikTok were originally designed for entertainment. People share fancy pictures or videos, or sometimes people share some small tips. So I do see the use of the image and the videos from the Instagram and the, uh, TikTok because and recently, I've seen more people started to share disaster-related information on those uh, platforms. So this is relevant to one thing I forgot to mention, but I do feel necessary is to develop a multimodal um, general AI models that can process different types of geospatial data or traditionally uh, non-geospatial data for, or for disaster uh, emergency management. So I do see this is a, uh, there is a great opportunity in there. And also considering the impact of those uh, video and image uh, centric platforms, it is also important to use those platforms as a way to disseminate disaster preparedness and response information to people who are much younger and uh, have no experience in disaster um, uh, management before. Yeah, thank you so much. Alex. So uh, we have more questions, uh, but we are already uh, running out of our time. So uh, let's thank uh, Leia again for this wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And I look forward to the upcoming uh, presentations. OK, so uh, now uh, we will go to our uh, the second part of our session. Uh, that, is, uh, the, um, that is the lightning talk series. So uh, I will start to uh, bring our speakers uh, onto stage uh, one by one. So uh, the, um, the way we will do the lightning talk is that uh, each speaker will do three minutes uh, and uh, we will hold on our questions until we have finished all five uh, lightning talks. So after our five lightning talks, we will have another uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, open uh, Q&A in which we can ask our uh, speakers questions and also discuss. So uh, our first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Jun Huang, and uh, uh, her talk is about wildfire burnt area detection with deep learning and the sentiment to imagery. So Jun, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? 
awesome. Okay, thanks, uh, Inji and uh, the um, and Andrew for for providing the opportunity. I'm a training um, associate professor from the Department of Geography at the University of Ma Wisconsin Madison. Today, I'm glad to introduce uh, a recent project led by my students Tangsui and Meilio. Wildfire burn area detection is important for post-fire management planning and the subsequent uh, recovery actions and uh, effort. The goal of this project is performing quick assessment uh, based on deep learning with minimal labels while maintaining good generalizability and high accuracy. Datasets are Sentinel-2 Level 2A product with a spatial resolution of 20 meter by 20 meter. Here we utilize three bands, included two short wave infrared and one nano near infrared. And this is the best combination for change detection of environment after wildfire. In order to validate and evaluate the generalizability of the proposed model, we utilize five wildfire events across different continents. Here is the framework of the proposed um, modeling process, including three key model um, components, including data preparation and pre-processing, which generated the input for the modeling training, followed by the model evaluation with different evaluation metrics and the model architecture. In particular, our model is based on the UNET architecture, including down sampling and up sampling in, in the encode and the decoder module. In particular, in our decoder process, we include uh, an attention gate at each layer of uh, upsampling process. This enabling the model incorporate spatial context and pay attention to details in particular areas uh, with um, small, with the, uh, with the, uh, small areas where the mixed pixels uh, occur, including the non burned pixel and the burned pixels are mixed together. Compared with the baseline model product from the Europe Space Agency and the different uh, UNET architectures, including the basic UNET with only one input and by temporal UNET, as well as by temporal UNET with uh, attention, we also explore different loss function, including binary cross entropy dice loss and the focal loss. In the end, the result indicated the proposed by temporal unit with attention with a combination of dice loss and the focal loss achieve a significant improvement compared with the baseline model. Well, due to time, I will stop here and happy to answer any question later. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shane. Very good timing too. Um, okay, so our next uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Man Zhu Yu, and her title is "Deciphering Wildfire Dynamics: Spatial Temporal Attention Based Sequence to Sequence Models Using Combo LSTM Networks." So, Man Zhu, the stage is yours. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So, my name is Man Zhu. I'm from uh, Penn State Geography. Today, I'm presenting a relatively similar to uh, Chinese topic, but we're focusing on wildfire progression, which is the spread of wildfire front. This is challenging. Can we move on to the next slide? Yes. This is challenging, particularly because it involves many biophysical factors interconnected, and it's also a dynamic problem. We often call this um, long range spatial or temporal correlation associated with something called spotting effect, which is the figure that you're seeing right now. That means embers can carry the fire to a distance area, distant area. So if there is fuel, then there will be a long-term trend, long range transport of the spatial correlation. Next slide, please. So we try to focus on predicting the next hour or the next days, um, burned area prediction. It is within the range of zero to one. So with a higher probability, you will have higher uh, value closer to one. 
we want to present this two attention based framework that utilize ConvalSTM. ConvalSTM is the um, precipitation prediction framework that produced uh, in 2015, but we're adding two attention framework on it. One is called the pairwise attention, which is the left figure, and the other is the right figure called patch based attention. Pair-based attention allow us to focus on the individual cells interaction. So it's more like a spotting effect, the long range transport. The patch base is more like a smooth version of it, but it has a uh, five by five or seven by seven kernel neighborhood. So these two framework can help us learn both local and global spatial correlation over time. Next slide, please. We tested our model on a, um, Simulation data set. It is a high resolution wildfire spread data set produced by a semi empirical percolation model. And we're using these two pair uh, and patch based attention comparing with the non attention conval STM. So overall, the patch and pair attention conval STM outperformed the non attention based conval STM. And for fire prediction, pair convolution, a convalescium is performing the best. And for no fire cells, the non-attention convalescium performed the best. Next slide, please. So the attention-based models, they all give us this attention matrix or attention weights. And we have the benefit of showing or visualizing how attention weights evolve over time for different models, for the non-attention, the pair, and patch. We can, um, next slide please. We can also visualize the spatial patterns and temporal changes in attention weights, along with the values of input variables. So now we're seeing that attention weights in the pair convalescium on the right hand figure, it aligns very well with the input features variable value. The patch based model, I did not put it here, but it has a smoother version of the spatial pattern because of its use of um, the five by five kernel neighborhood for each target cell. So what does this mean practically? We're trying to predict the, um, the five front location, but also we're having some kinds of uh, uh, interpretation related to ecological factors. So it's not just predicting where fire front might move, it might have actual fire management um, implications. Okay, next slide. Thank you for your attention. I'm open to any question. Uh, okay, so uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Major uh, Zachariah. So uh, you can start to share your screen now. Yes, yeah, we can see you. Uh, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. Hello everyone, thank you for giving me such an opportunity. Myself, MD Zakaria Selim. I'm doing my master's in geography and also a graduate teaching assistant at University of South Florida. We already know that Hurricane Idalia hit Florida on September 30, 2023, but my research is based on Hurricane Ian. That was on the last year. Today, I'm delighted to discuss a comprehensive analysis of Hurricane Ian by examining both its physical variables and socioeconomic variables. So without any further ado, I'm going to my main presentation. Hurricane Ian, a name etched into the memory of every Floridian over a span of several days after forming on September 23, the disturbance gained strength and organization. On September 28, Hurricane Ian had reached its peak intensity. It was classified as a Category 4 hurricane with sustained windy speeds exceeding 160 miles per hour with 937 hectopascal. If we have a look at the statistics, we can see 52,000 houses are damaged are impacted by Hurricane Ian and uh, on them 5,369 houses are completely damaged and 161 people died and the total economic loss is 112 billion. So without any question, it is one of the most costliest hurricane in the Florida history. 
And now if we have a look at an example of a rich and poor community, we can see an interesting fact here. A rich community close to coastal area got higher damage where house value is approximately 1 million. And on the other hand, comparatively low income community with a distance from coastal area got less damage, even if their house value is approximately 343k. So it is very crucial to integrate socioeconomic variables to get the actual scenario of damage extent of Hurricane Ian. And my analytical workflow includes four steps from image collection to spatial analysis. I collected a damage proxy map created by NASA. Then I used journal statistical tools to uh, aggregate to our building data with damage pixel. Then I aggregate census track data from boundary of impact from Hurricane Ian using interpolation method to conduct a spatial analysis using physical variables. And my research question is, what are the factors of damage? So the, the color variation from pale yellow to red indicates increasingly more significant surface change, as you can see on the map. And I conducted a hierarchical regression to find out which variables are most influential and can predict the model very well. As you can see, the adjusted R square value from control variables came up with a 0.071, and uh, which means it can interpret about only 7% of the damage variance. And uh, after that, I included both control and socioeconomic variables that resulted in a more significant model, where it can interpret 17% of damage variance. Uh, so it is a big, very good progress and big leap from control variables to socioeconomic variables. If we have a look at socioeconomic variables, we can see the percentage of unemployment, elderly people, Asian people are showed a negative correlation between the damage data and the variables. And own house showed a positive, coefficient, a positive correlation between the damage variance, as we can see the positive coefficient value. To some of this comprehensive analysis exemplifies the interplay between physical variables and socioeconomic variables. Uh, thank you, everyone. If you have any question, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Ching Ching Chen. So, Ching Ching, the stage is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. So, today I'm going to share a study titled Community Resilience to uh, Wildfires uh, Network Analysis Approach by Analyzing uh, Utilizing Human Mobility Data. So, Disasters such as uh, wildfires uh, often result in significant impacts on the environment, uh, wildfires, and human populations. Therefore, understanding the impact of wildfires and resilience of areas become essential. So, national academics defined resilience as how, where uh, assistance can reestablish stability and functions from the disruptions uh, of disasters over time. But how to quantify resilience? Um, it's a still an opening question. So in this study, we propose a framework to capture potential impact of disruptions of disasters to access the community's resilience to wildfires. So this is an overview of the workflow. So doing this allows us to answer questions such as which communities is more resilient? What, uh, uh, what is the impact? Uh, to illustrate the proposed idea, we take the Mendoza complex as camp wildfires in California as case study and the use of human mobility data collected from a uh, safe graph for analysis. Moreover, um, we uh, also borrow the concepts from the. Okay, so so on the so, sorry about the internet. So we also borrow the concept of resilience of triangles from disaster science, which is first introduced by the Bronner's in two thousand three to quantify resilience, and it is commonly used to measure the abrupt functionality loss of a social unit like a communities over time under the disruptions of disaster. So keep this in mind. We constructed a home to destination networks uh, from the data to uh, evaluate the degree of importance of the CBG in the network. The measures the green centralities is used as the proxies for disasters, uh, resilience evaluations based on the resilience triangles of formations. So we can identify the uh, triangles based on their changing patterns of the green centralities. So to make the comparisons between CBG and small SD, we first classify the CBGs into groups as measures the resilience triangle for each cluster, as the results allows us to identify which clusters is more resilient than the other. But 
why? So to understand the potential factors that contribute to the resilience. So we select several factors related to demographic and socioeconomic uh, status and spiritual environments characteristics to perform the regression analysis. As the result shows, variables such as average uh, travel distance, number of housing units, full-time workers, median house income, and so on do impact the resilience. As it should be noticed that the regression analysis used here does not intend to predict resilience based on the variables, but instead to provide an initial quantitative explorations of the potential covariance that impacts the, uh, the resilience. So overall, the study scale up the concept of the resilience to a more empirical framework that can be quantified and visualized. That's all. Thank you and welcome for any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, last but not least, uh, our speaker is Kai Kai Shun. Hello, everyone. I'm Kai. The title of my presentation is Gallup, a geoannotator for labeling location descriptions from disaster related text messages. Uh, people are increasingly, uh, have been increasingly using social media to seek help and share information during natural disasters. Uh, these messages on social media often contain critical location descriptions about victims and accidents. Here we have one example tweet from Hurricane Harvey. 2799 Sands Avenue, Port Arthur, Texas. Please help this family out. They are stuck in their home with children. Hashtag Hurricane Harvey. If we can accurately extract these location descriptions, we may be able to help the disaster responders to reach those people in need more quickly and may even save lives. But many of the location descriptions are not simple place names and cannot be extracted using typical named entity recognition tools. We can train new machine learning models to extract these location descriptions, but there is often a lack of data available in this way. To efficiently create such a data set, we need a data annotation tool. In fact, there already exist three tools for labeling place names from text, including WOTR geometer, PICO geometer, and GOVs. But they still have two limitations. The first limitation is that these tools, they only support the annotation of place names existing in a guest year. But many of the location descriptions do not exist in a typical guest year and cannot be annotated. The second limitation is that these tools they do not support the annotation of location description categories. Uh, to address these two limitations, we are currently developing Gallup, which is a web-based and open source geoannotator uh, for labeling location descriptions. These two address these two limitations by supporting the annotation of complete location descriptions and their categories. To further help human annotators to create data sets efficiently and uh, accurately, we provide some ma additional major functions, including the annotation of multilingual text messages, automatic text pre annotation, automatic spatial footprint identification, and multi user collaborative annotation. Uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you.